Deruan Saranai. Welcome everyone to our Binara Full Moon Poya Dhamma session. Heartfelt good wishes to all of you on this Oposatha day. Today we will be examining the Mahachatarisika Sutta. This is Majaminikaya discourse number 117. This is from the Middle Length Discourses. And it's known as the teaching, the Buddha's teaching on the Great Forty. So what we'll cover today is our usual tips and reminders. We'll do a quick recap of the Four Noble Truths. And this is really to refresh our minds and to see the context for this particular teaching from the Buddha about developing and activating the Noble Eightfold Path and how it leads to the development of noble right concentration. It was actually a question that was received through the website on noble right concentration and this particular sutta. So we're going to touch on what is the right path, what is the wrong path, and we'll revisit that throughout this Dhamma session and as we go through the Buddha's teaching in this particular sutta. We'll then do a quick intro into this particular sutta, briefly taking a look at, as usual, the sutta architecture, how the teaching is constructed, and why this is important for us to learn. In fact, this particular teaching is very, very important. Then we'll do our usual deep dive, get right into the sutta itself and what the Buddha is actually teaching. Now, although the Buddha starts off by saying he's going to teach how to develop the noble or supramundane right concentration, and he says this with its supports and requisites, essentially, this particular teaching is all about understanding how the Noble Eightfold Path actually works, how we activate each path factor and develop it, and how it's always led by the right view. So we've spoken about this many times before, how important right view is. And this particular teaching from the Buddha really emphasizes the importance of right view. And the teaching confirms much of what we already know um, about what we do in our Yanapatha meditations, our insight pathway meditations, that when we follow the Buddha's teaching, we usually start with right view. And all along the way, we are activating and, and even correcting wrong view to right view and continuously developing on the Noble Eightfold Path. So this teaching on the Great Forty, it's really important because by the end of it, we get this understanding about how valuable, how much substance is behind the Buddha's teaching on the Noble Eightfold Path. And so there's a lot to learn in this sutta, but we'll do our best to try and cover as much as possible and encourage towards really penetrating this, this teaching. And then we'll come to questions and answers after we go through the sutta. So our usual tips and reminders. So as always, you know, we, we keep it fresh. We keep an open mind. We may know some things, we may not know some things, and so we keep an open mind to, to learn something new. Part of this is around Sutta Mayapanya, so uh, the wisdom that arises from listening to the Buddha's words. And at the same time, always, if we don't understand anything, then we always have an opportunity to ask or to study it further. But be okay if we don't 100% understand everything that we go through. And remember, we're all learners, we're all seekers, so we're at different stages of development here we're not like the arahats who are fully developed so we are always learning and as we go through apply ourselves to the buddha's words be encouraged by them really try to get behind the meaning of of what buddha is saying and of course uh think about our own examples as we go through because that's where the direct experience comes in outside of formal meditation and have good wishes for everyone that has helped be here today to guide us in our Dhamma practice, to develop and to, to see the truth of how things really are. So we're going to begin with the quick recap of the Four Noble Truths. So this first slide we've seen before, and really this is just to refresh, refresh our minds that all the Arahants and the Buddhas, they became awakened through the Four Noble Truths. All the ascetics, all the summoners, the Brahmins, they also became awakened through the Four Noble Truths. The Buddha says that this is what happened in the past, this was what will happen in the future, and at the present as well, that it's through the Four Noble Truths. 
So he defines in one instance, he says, ignorance is not knowing the Four Noble Truths and being immersed in that ignorance. And one of the other things he says then is knowledge is knowing the Four Noble Truths and then exerting ourselves to understand them. This is in the Sangyutta Nikaya. So we come to understand that understanding and penetrating these Four Noble Truths is integral to realizing the end of all suffering. And so when we remember from this table that the Noble Truth of Dukkha is where we translate that as suffering, it's those 12 terms that begin with birth is suffering all the way down to not getting what we want and also that the five aggregates subject to clinging is also suffering. The second Noble Truth is there is the origin of, of suffering, which is craving. The third Noble Truth is the cessation of, of suffering. And then the fourth Noble Truth is the way leading to the cessation of suffering, which is what we know as the Noble Eightfold Path. And that's what we're going to focus on today. So we can see that dependent origi origination comes through this. We can see this in the Four Noble Truths. The first two Noble Truths are the arising, the Samudaya. This is how we construct our existence out of one of the three kinds of craving. And so that then becomes the condition for birth. And with birth comes aging and death and then the whole mass of suffering. The last two noble truths on this side is really about the passing away, the athangama. This is when we don't create another existence. We renunciate all the craving and we fully develop this noble eightfold path. And therefore, we realize the highest truth, which is this complete cessation of, of all suffering. That's Nibbana. So therefore, we're no longer bound to samsara. So if we correctly contemplate even just that, the samudaya, the arising, and the passing away, the, the ceasing, the atangama, then what the Buddha says is that one of two fruits can be ex expected, final knowledge in this very life, or if there is a residue the state of non-return, so anagami, path and fruit of an anagami. So again, what we've learned before are there, there are three stages and 12 insights. So the first and second stage is really around a, being a seeker, a learner or a trainee. So when we are learner or tra trainee, we understand that this knowledge of the truth, that there is suffering, there is craving, there is a cessation of suffering, and there is also this path. That's the way out of suffering, the Noble Eightfold Path. As a seeker, we also know that these things need to be done. We must uh, fully understand suffering. We must abandon all craving, and we must realize cessation and fully develop the Noble Eightfold Path. So we know this is what we need to do. So for us, we are in this first two stages. The third stage is really the Arahant, the one who has fully awakened and liberated. So they already know what has been done. So Dukkha has been fully understood. Craving has been abandoned. Cessation of suffering has been realized. And the noble path has been developed. So in today's session, we will be focusing on this column here, the Noble Eightfold Path. However, that doesn't mean that we don't look at the other noble truths as well. In fact, the Buddha says that by seeing and understanding how the Noble Eightfold Path works, which is this fourth noble truth, then we also see and understand the other truths. This is in the Gavampati Sutta, and this is where Venerable Gavampati was uh, listening to the Buddha, and he had heard and learned that the Buddha had said, by seeing one noble truth, then we see them all. So what we will also uh, delve into when we're looking at this Mahachatarisaka Sutta is we'll be looking at the Buddha's words on what constitutes the right path, which is the one below, and what constitutes the wrong path, which is the one above that one. And this is really important because it's a valuable part of knowing, knowing if we're on the right track and knowing where we are with our spiritual path and practice. If you have the wrong path, then you begin with the wrong view. You develop this wrong path and it results in the wrong kind of concentration. And with the wrong concentration, it proceeds from this eightfold path, it proceeds to wrong knowledge and wrong liberations. So that makes it tenfold. 
But if you have the right path, you begin with right view and you develop all the other right path factors, then it results in right concentration and it culminates in right knowledge and right liberation. Again, it makes it tenfold. And with the right path, you uh, realize Nibbana. So the Buddha offers us a very clear look at three things in this sutta. And what happens is he shows us this wrong path. He shows us the right path, but it's divided into two. One that he calls the mundane or worldly path, which means there is some development, but it still leads back to rebirth in samsara. So you're still bound to the whole mass of suffering. That's what is called the mundane right path. But then there is another path that we will delve into, which is the noble, tainless, supramundane. And when that fully develops, this particular right path leads to the full liberation. And so although it may appear that we get to choose, if you penetrate even a little bit of the four noble truths, you quickly come to realize that the only path is the one that is noble, taintless, and supramundane, the lokotora, uh, lokotora path. So let's begin with our intro into the sutta. So with the sutta architecture, it's broken into four main parts. So it begins with the Buddha open, openly stating that he's going to give a teaching on noble right concentration with its supports and requisites. Then part two is he begins with right view, stating that it comes first, and he gives a teaching on right view and the distinction between wrong view and the twofold right view. The next part of the teaching is really explaining about wrong intention and the twofold wrong uh, right intention, then wrong speech and the twofold right speech, then wrong action and the twofold right action, then wrong livelihood and the twofold right livelihood. What happens as he goes through is that he talks about how right view and right effort and right mindfulness run and circle together in order to activate and help the path. It's part of the support. And that's how you get to the noble right concentration. And then the fourth part is where the Buddha ends with summarizing the great 40, talking about 20 wholesome factors and 20 unwholesome factors. So that's basically what we'll be looking at today. We're going to spend quite a lot of time on right view and right intention because renunciation is a huge part of the Buddha's path to liberation. So what is really, really emphasized in this teaching is right view and how one has right view and how it applies for every single path factor. So it's good to really take a note of this as we go through because if you understand the Buddha's instructions correctly, it helps us immensely. And if we discover things uh, as we hear this teaching from the Buddha, then that you know you haven't heard before or you haven't been aware of before, then it's good to to actually look into it, to look into what aspect of the development of the spiritual practice that it is coming coming up around. Is it around right view or right intention? Is it some aspect of higher virtue or concentration or wisdom? And if it comes up and you you wonder about your path and practice, it's a good thing. Consider it a good thing, not a bad thing, because it's better to find out now than to work through these things and then later at the point of death, you think, oh, oh no. And so sooner rather than later. So all these things are good things. If, if we find that in our path and practice, we need to attend to something a little more to correct it. So when we develop this practice in accordance with the Buddha's teaching, we are continuously instructed to start with right view. Now, people ask, how often uh, is right view active? And the answer, honest answer is that it's probably not enough. If we truly had active right view, then we wouldn't su suffer so much on a, on a daily basis. We wouldn't, um, we would have attained to higher uh, realization of path and fruit. So if noble right view is active, more more often than not, then these things are what we can realize. So if we find that our view is not correct, we need to take the opportunity to heed the Buddha's instructions in this teaching 
And at the same time, what this teaching will unfold is that all the factors in the Noble Eightfold Path, they are connected, they're interlinked, they're running and circling around each other, and they're holding up this noble right concentration. So what we'll see is that they don't operate in isolation and we'll be clearly instructed on how to develop the whole path, not just one or two factors of the path, but the whole path. So we've already touched on some of these things already. And the question is, why is this teaching important? It's important because it highlights that distinction between wrong view or wrong practice, mundane and super mundane paths and practice. We also see that the Buddha emphasizes the importance of right view, that it is the forerunner, it's the leader of this noble eightfold path. And then thirdly, the Buddha explains in quite a lot of detail how each path factor is activated and developed and how the path factors support the noble right concentration. And then through the great 40, what we come to see by the end of this teaching is how it severs underlying tendencies, so these anusayas, and leads us out to what is profitable. We're always leaning towards profitable when we develop the Noble Eightfold Path through this, this great 40 teaching. And it helps us to know and see the Four Noble Truths and with wisdom. Uh, so not something that we blindly believe or we, we simply come to. It, it is with wisdom being applied. And we can also diagnose whether we are practicing correctly towards the end of all suffering. So let's deep dive into how we develop. So the Buddha begins the teaching with this statement, this opening statement, because I shall teach you noble right concentration with its supports and its requisites. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, venerable sir, the bhikkhus replied. The blessed one said this. What bhikkhus is noble right concentration with its supports and its requisites? That is right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, and right mindfulness. Unification of mind equipped with these seven factors is called noble right concentration with its supports and its requisites. So before we launch right into noble right concentration, Let's take a moment to talk about meditation or development of mind. So when the question is asked, why do we meditate? One of the common answers to the question is, we meditate to concentrate and to reach unification of the mind. One pointedness is another way of saying that. Now, although that's a good answer, the issue that one can have with it is that it doesn't distinguish the Buddha's teaching on right concentration from, say, worldly mundane concentration and one-pointedness. So the mundane concentration and one-pointedness can arise from peak moments in sport, from sex, from taking drugs, from skill in the military, and much, much more. The reason people are attracted to those peak moments is due to the, the high level of concentration and the stilling of one's thoughts. So that is one kind of unification of mind. The second one is at the time of the Buddha, there were other spiritual practices that were there before and also at the time of the Buddha where people could attain to a level of concentration which was also one-pointed or unified. So the point here with this particular question is what makes the Buddha's teachings unique, valuable and profound from all these other ways of unifying the mind? And the answer is really that the Buddha's teaching is not simply concentration that is one-pointed and unified, as we would conventionally understand it. It's not simply forcing the mind to stop and abide in a quiet place, which may still be rooted in greed, hatred, and delusion. And it is not simply concentrating just for concentration's sake. So when you understand that, and you understand what it is not, then you understand that this predicament in samsara that the Buddha teaches about, these four noble truths, that there is suffering, that there is craving as the origin of suffering, then the Buddha's teaching is really about getting out of this whole mass of suffering. That is the purpose of any kind of concentration that is being taught by the Buddha. If we develop the noble eightfold path, 
which for all intents and purposes uh, from the Buddha's perspective, it's his definition for meditation, development of the mind. We develop the noble path leading to the ending of all suffering. And that's why we develop noble right concentration. And where do we go once we develop noble right concentration? Well, noble right concentration, the Buddha says, gives rise to right knowledge, samanyana. And with right knowledge, this gives rise to right deliverance or liberation, samavimutti. So this essentially verifies if we have taken the right path. The Buddha explicitly shows us and instructs on liberation of the mind, so cetto vimutti, and liberation due to wisdom, panya vimutti, and so on from there. So this is a very important part of understanding the Buddha's opening statement about noble right concentration, this aryang samasamadhi. This is the concentration that has seven factors that support it to produce noble right concentration. It is rooted in non-greed, non-hatred, and non-delusion. And it is what is needed to realize Nibbana. So let's first start look at our right view, the path factor of right view. So the Buddha says, therein because right view comes first. And how does right view come first? One understands wrong view is wrong view and right view is right view. This is one's right view. So the ability to make the distinction between what is wrong and what is right in terms of our view is fundamental to uh, you know, knowing and, and penetrating the truth. And then the Buddha talks about wrong view uh, and clarifies what that is. And the Buddha talks about right view, which is mundane, and then noble right view. So let's look at wrong view. The Buddha says, and what because is wrong view? There is nothing given, nothing offered, nothing sacrificed, no fruit or result of good and bad actions, no this world, no other world, no mother, no father, no beings who are reborn spontaneously, no good and virtuous recluses and Brahmins in the world who have realized for themselves by direct knowledge and declare this world and the other, this is wrong view. So what we gather from that statement is that wrong view is this distorted perspective that there is no karma involved in our volitional activity. So in terms of nothing given, nothing offered, nothing sacrificed, this is not denying that it's good to give or make offerings or making sacrifices. But what is fundamental to the wrong view is that a person believes that there's no karmic result or merit from any of our volitional activity of giving, offering, and sacrificing. When it comes to Buddha's statement about no fruit or result of good and bad actions, again, this is a rejection of karma, that there's a cause and effect of our, our action. And so it's rejecting that there's merit or demerit as a result of our actions, denial of any kind of karmic fruit. And then in terms of there's no this world or no other world, this is a rejection that after death with the breakup of the body, there is no uh, transmigration, no other existence. And so a person who has this particular wrong view thinks that we only suffer in this life and there's nothing after this life, so that's it and nothing to worry about. And so they're in for a very big shock with this particular wrong view. Now, in terms of no mother, no father, this is not denying that we have parents or that we're born to our parents. It's the rejection of the view that our parents have made this great sacrifice and gift for us to be born into the human realm. And so there's no understanding of repaying that debt, no understanding of the merit of taking care of one's parents, ensuring their well-being, fulfilling our obligations to them, even repaying the debt with sharing Dhamma with them. So the wrong view takes on that more selfish view that we only need to take care of ourselves, nothing more. There's no merit in doing anything else and therefore no understanding of demerit either. And then when the Buddha says no beings are reborn spontaneously, this is the, the a denial that those there are those that are that are born or they arise spontaneously into other realms without a visible cause. So they're not born relying on parents or on a womb. So the example from the Buddhist teachings is being spontaneously reborn to hell realms and also to heavenly realms, including non-returners born into the pure abodes. 
And then the last part is about no good and virtuous recluses and Brahmins in the world to have realized for themselves direct knowledge and declare this world and the other world. This is a rejection of those that have enlightened or fully liberated. This includes the Buddha, denying that they have their people that have that have chosen the life of a renunciant or an ascetic, and they've willingly done that to turn away from the world, and they've done that to attain to higher concentrations and to uh, find the direct knowledge for themselves and liberate. And so, uh, if you have this wrong view, you may reject the teachings of people who who have done this this thing, including the Buddha's teachings, and you think that. Such people are ignorant or foolish that they're missing out on central pleasures of the world. They're missing out on the good things in life, not understanding. And so the Buddha says that when someone has such a wrong view, this incorrect perspective, it's a failure in view. And because of that, they will be reborn into the plane of misery, a bad destination in the lower world, in hell. So this is with the breakup of the body, if you have the failure in view. So when we know that, then what we aspire to is to develop the right view. So the mundane right view, the Buddha says, and what because is right view? And he says right view is twofold. So the first one is right view that is affected by taints, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions. Um and then the second one is right view that is noble, taintless, supramundane, a factor of the path. So the first one is essentially samaditi, sasava, punabhagya, upadi, vipaka. So this is someone affected by the taints, so still conditioned by the taints, bound to the taints, partaking of merit, so hasn't gone beyond making merit. And ripens in the acquisitions, which really means one is still clinging to the five aggregates and the cords of sensual desire and the defilements and will be reborn again, bound to be reborn again. The right view that is noble, so this is Samaditi, Arya, Anasava, Lokotara, and Maganga. So this is supramundane, noble. It is a factor of the path. So if you develop that, you can develop all the rest of the factors of the Noble Eightfold Path and realize Nibbana. So let's firstly look at this mundane right view. So the Buddha says, and what because is right view that is affected by the taints, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisition, there is what is given and what is offered and what is sacrificed. There is fruit and result of good and bad actions. There is this world and the other world. There is this mother and father. There are beings who are reborn spontaneously. There are in the world good and virtuous recluses and Brahmins who have realized for themselves by direct knowledge and declare this world and the other world. This is right view affected by taints, partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions. So clearly this replaces wrong view with the right view that there is karma and karmic causality of our volitional activities. And so they the people that understand this, they have realized with direct knowledge and they have declared the path to liberation from this sansaric predicament. However, this particular pathway is still affected by taints, partaking of merit, ripening in acquisitions. So this is still a worldly right view. It does not uproot the taints. It hasn't gone beyond karma and it still activates dependent origination. And so you keep coming back into samsara and so although this is an accomplishment in view what will happen is you're likely to be reborn into a good destination a heavenly world now how we can understand this better is if we refer to our table about the four unprofitable directions so this is the one that looks at the four nutriments so if you look at this table and you look at the line in yellow, you see this is where the taints are. Karmasava, taint of sensual desire. Bhavasava, taint of existence. Dityasava, taint of views. And Avijaasava, taint of ignorance. So when we go down all these four unprofitable directions, we are affected by the taints. And these taints arise because of the four nutriments. So physical nutriment, contact is nutriment, mental volition is nutriment, and consciousness is nutriment. 
This is why the teens come to arrive. And as we know, there are many other conditions in between that that also lead to the arising of the teens. So the perversions, our craving, clinging, bonds, body ties. And so when the taints arise as a condition of all these other things, then what we know is that it leads to the floods, the darts, and consciousness will steady on any of these points, the so form, feeling, perception, and volitional formations. And so we go the wrong ways. So we go the wrong way through desire, the wrong way through hate, the wrong way through fear, and the wrong way through delusion. This is what binds us to sansara. This is what it means when we simply have the mundane right view. We're still bound because we haven't seen through these things. This is why we meditate on the four nutriments to understand it better and to correct our view. So when we have this mundane, worldly right view, this is what it means that it produces taints. We still have ignorance. And so we produce these volitional formations, these sankharas, as part of dependent origination, and we're born again and again. So let's take an example. We can live our life performing meritorious deeds and wholesome actions by body, speech, and mind. And we can expect a good result, like the fruit of making merit. At the same time, we can also live this life performing unwholesome actions, and we can expect to bear the fruit of those unwholesome actions with demeritorious deeds. But essentially, we're still caught up in good karma and bad karma, and we have to face the result. There's no escape from it. So if we see clearly, then we, we know that that path is risky, that this mundane right view path is still risky. And so we want to develop the noble right view that leads to the escape from the whole predicament, because it's a bit like potluck. You don't know what your complete merit balance is from past lifetimes and even from this lifetime. So then what is noble right view? So the Buddha says, and what bhikkhus is right view that is noble, taintless, supramundane, a factor of the path? And the Buddha answers, the wisdom, the faculty of wisdom, the power of wisdom, the investigation of dhamma, enlightenment factor, the path factor of right view, in one whose mind is noble, whose mind is taintless, who possesses the noble path and is developing the noble path. This is right view that is noble, taintless, supramundane, a factor of the path. So when the Buddha says noble, and there's a lot in that statement, so we're going to unpack it bit by bit. So when the Buddha says noble, Arya, the Buddha is talking about this bigger universal predicament that affects all living beings. When the Buddha talks about taintless, that means we understand that there are these few, four nutriments that lead to the four wrong way. And so we don't want to have these four nutriments, craving for these four nutriments as a condition for the arising of the taint. When the Buddha says it's super mundane, that means the Buddha is referring to path and fruit of stream entry, once return, non-return, arahant, with Nibbana as the ninth. And when we talk about the factor of the path, then with the other path factors in the Noble Eightfold Path, that's what leads to the complete liberation, the complete cessation of all suffering. So that's the first aspect. The second one is around where the Buddha refers to noble right view or super mundane right view. And he talks about the mind that is noble, the mind that is taintless, the mind, the one who possesses the noble path and develops the noble path. So Arya Chittasa is the one whose mind is noble. So these are the minds like the noble Arahants in the pure abodes. Anasava Chittasa, one whose mind is taintless, is again these noble Arahants. Arya Magga Samangino, that's one who possesses the noble path. So anyone who has attained path and fruit of stream entry, once return and non-return. And then the last one is Arya Magang Bhava Yato. So one who is developing the noble path. This is anyone who is practicing and developing the Noble Eightfold Path, maintaining non-greed, non-hatred, non-delusion, any of the skilled states of mind that support the Noble Eightfold Path 
and maybe haven't attained to path and fruit as yet. And so from that, we realize that the Buddha includes with that supramundane noble right view, it includes wisdom, panya, the faculty of wisdom, panya indriyam, the power of wisdom, panya bala, the investigation of dhamma enlightenment factor, which is dhamma vicheya sambhojanga, the path factor of right view, samaditi malangang which is part of the noble right view. So noble right co concentration can arise when you have this noble right view and wisdom, and that includes all these different faculties of wisdom, power of wisdom, and the investigation of Dhamma, enlightenment factor. So what does this mean? What exactly is the noble right view and wisdom that the Buddha is referring to? So if we refresh our minds, with Venerable Sariputta's teaching in Samaditi Sutta, where he uses a form of question and answer to teach the bhikkhus, he says, one of right view, one of right view, is said, friend. In what way is a noble disciple one of right view, whose view is straight, who has unwavering confidence in the Dhamma and has arrived at this true Dhamma? Venerable Sariputta then goes on to give a very detailed teaching of the 16 ways in which a noble disciple understands Dhamma that would activate right view and effectively corrects or straightens any wrong views. So if you were to summarize it, it's really these 16 things. The main ones you start with are the unwholesome and the root of unwholesome and the wholesome and the root of wholesome. The second is around nutrients, as we've looked at just briefly before, the origin of those nutrients, the cessation of those nutrients, and the way leading to the cessation of the nutrients. Then there's suffering, so the Four Noble Truths, the suffering, origin of suffering, cessation of suffering, and the way leading to the cessation of suffering. Then the fourth to the fifth, so from aging and death all the way to ignorance, 15. These are the links in dependent origination. So each link their origin, cessation, and the way leading to their cessation. If you understand any of these links, that is equivalent to right view. And the last one is the taints, that you understand the taints, the origin of taints, the cessation of taints, and the way leading to the cessation of taints. So any one of these 16 aspects activates right view. Now, when we formally meditate, and we devote ourselves to development into the higher concentration through a jnanapatha, an insight pathway, or just contemplating any of these things. That's when we understand and know clearly. That's when we penetrate the truth of any of these dhammas with wisdom, directly experience it ourselves. That's when noble or supramundane right view develops or gets activated. So someone who has noble attainment of path and fruit like Sotapanna or Sakadagami or Anagami, when wisdom arises in the meditation and right view arises in the meditation as a result of penetrating any of these dhammas, that wisdom remains with that person because there's been lifting of the doorba of ignorance and a, a very clear direct insight. And that is confirmed, you know, by checking with the Buddha's teaching. Now, that's not the case for someone who doesn't have the noble attainment. Even though they're developing the, the path, that wisdom may not remain. So the example that one can give is, so someone who's not an arahant, so for an arahant it's different, but for someone who has any one of the other attainments, like Sotapanna, Sakadagami or Anagami, say for example they have one of those attainments, path and fruit, and the craving may arise when there is hunger and thirst. So that's when craving arises. But at other times, the craving is not active. So if they're not around food or drink and, and uh, they're not hungry or thirsty, that craving doesn't activate. But those that don't have the noble attainment of path and fruit, then they may be persistently disturbed by such craving, whether they're hungry or not, hungry or thirsty or not. They desire it at a mental level and it will come up again and again. So that's one example. So the Buddha goes on to say, once you've activated the noble right view, the Buddha says, one makes an effort to abandon wrong view and to enter upon right view. This is one's right effort. Mindfully one abandons wrong view. Mindfully one enters upon and abides in right view. This is one's right mindfulness. Thus, these three states, 
run and circle around right view. That is right view, right effort, and right mindfulness. What the Buddha is saying here is that right view, right effort, and right mindfulness, they work together. Right effort and right mindfulness takes the instruction from right view. Noble right view says, this is wrong view and this is right view. Right effort abandons, develops, and protects according to what right view says. And then right mindfulness is the gatekeeper that ensures that it happens and it provides support. So what does this mean in practice? So if we take an example, say someone who loves to eat unhealthy food, they have a really bad diet, whether it's fried food, fatty food, high in sugar, what have you. And their doctor advises them that if they continue with this unhealthy diet, they will have massive cholesterol issues and serious heart issues and a very high chance of an early death. So this person who has a very strong craving or tendency towards unhealthy food, they decide to give it up based on the doctor's advice and they start on, on partaking of a more healthy diet. But whenever they see someone who is eating the food that they used to eat, the unhealthy food, their past tendency comes up, it gets triggered and the craving arises again for unhealthy food. Now, at that time, if they remember the doctor's advice, that they mustn't go there because the, all these bad things will happen. Then um, what activates is the right view, that healthy food is good, unhealthy food is bad. And so that kicks in and it activates. Now, when that is active, which is the right view, they apply right effort. They refrain from the unhealthy food, see clear of it. And then they're very mindful to refrain moving forward, to give up the desire for unhealthy food and stick to only healthy food. So through the example, you can see how right view, right effort, right mindfulness runs, circles together, works together. Every action that we do has these three circle around. This works with right view, right effort, right mindfulness, but in a similar fashion, it also works with wrong view, wrong effort and wrong mindfulness. So the example of an unhealthy eater the Buddha here is the doctor. The Buddha is telling us, abandon unskilled states, unwholesome states. They're bad for us. And he's encouraging us to get rid of them and to see them as dukkha. So now we come to the path factor of right intention. So we're going to spend quite a bit of time on this path factor because it's very important and we can understand a lot from it. And we're going to make reference to another sutta as well. So the Buddha says, therein because right view comes first. How does right view come first? One understands wrong intention as wrong intention and right intention as right intention. This is one's right view. So we see again the, the Buddha's emphasizing right view comes first and making the distinction between wrong intention and right intention. And so he's teaching us about wrong intention that results in unskillful thoughts and wrong path and practice and the two different kinds of right intention which is one which is mundane and one which is supramundane. So let's first look at the one that is wrong intention. So the Buddha says, and what because is wrong intention? And the answer is the intention of sensual desire, the intention of ill will, and the intention of cruelty. This is wrong intention. So this is pretty straightforward. We've heard this before from the Buddha and the noble arahants. Unfortunately, this is what is prevalent and evident in the world that we inhabit. And it is rooted in greed, hatred, and delusion, and part of unprofitable power. These are unskilled states of the mind that are conducive to rebirth in lower realms. And if reborn as a human, we can expect unfavorable conditions. So knowing this, what we want to develop is right intention. So with right intention, the Buddha says, and what because is right intention? And then he says there's twofold. The one that is affected by taints, partaking of merit, ripening in acquisitions. And then the one that is noble, taintless, supramundane, and a factor of the path. And then he goes on to talk about the one that is affected by taints and partaking of, of merit, ripening in acquisitions. So this is the intention of renunciation. It's really the medicine for having the intentions for sensual desire. Then you have the intention for non-ill will. It is the medicine for intentions for ill will. And the intention for non-cruelty is the medicine for any of the intentions towards cruelty or harm. 
And then when the Buddha talks about the noble right intention, uh, that one's quite lengthy and we'll go through that. Uh, it says that in one whose mind is noble, so again, making reference to these references we said before, one whose mind is taintless, one who possesses the noble path or who is developing the noble path. It is the thinking, the thoughts, intentions, uh, mental absorption, mental fixis fixity, directing of mind, verbal formation in one whose mind is noble and taintless and so forth. So in Pali, this is tako vikako sankapo apana biapana chetaso abhiniropana vachi sankaro. So let's go through these words. As we said, tako, that means the thinking or reasoning. Vitako, we know as thought or initial thought or reflection. Sankapo means our intention or plan, our determination as well. Apana means mental absorption, but it also can mean purpose. Biapana, we call mental fixity. But it can also be focusing or having a mental resolve. Chetaso abhini ropana means directing the mind. It also means mentally applying or it can be uplifting the mind. And then vachi sankara we know is verbal formation or, or the mental chatter. So what we can glean from those words, those particular words, is that it is all the mental activity of directing and applying the mind, including the verbal formation, that arise in someone whose mind is noble, taintless, or possesses the noble path, or who is developing the noble path. So what we want to know is the distinction between the mundane right intention and the supramundane right intention. How do we go from the mundane to the supramundane? So we're going to look at the Salayatana Vibhanga Sutta. This is Majjhimi Kaya, Discourse number 137. And we're going to spend a bit of time on this because it's very important. And this is the Buddha's teaching on the sixfold base. This is where the Buddha, the part that we're going to focus on is where the Buddha talks about an explanation of happiness, sadness, and equanimity of a household life and happiness, sadness, and equanimity of renunciation. And the reason we're spending time on this is because renunciation is fundamental to this path to liberation, you know, the Buddha's teaching on this. And this Salayatana Vibhanga Sutta is very helpful when you combine it with this Mahachattarisika Sutta that we're looking at today. So let's first look at the joy that arises from household life. The Buddha says that there are six kinds of joy based on household life, and they're associated, associated with the sixfold base. So we regard, we get happy when we, we, we regard as a gain, gains from forms cognizable by the eye that we wish for, desire, agreeable, gratifying, associated with worldliness, or we recall something that we have gained in that way before. Joy arises for us in that way. And the same with sounds cognizable by the ear, odors cognizable by the nose, flavors cognizable by the tongue, physical sensations cognizable by the body, and mind objects, mental objects, co cognizable by the mind. So examples of this, it's when you win money on a lottery ticket, when you got a job promotion, when you make gains on the stock market, when you recall your wedding day or the birth of a child, when you recall your body when it was younger, when you got an upgrade, when you go on holiday or some kind of unique experience. This is the joy that is based on household life. It's very mundane, very worldly. Then the Buddha talks about on this side the six kinds of joy that are associated with renunciation. And the six kinds is really associated with knowing the impermanence, change, fading away, and cessation of forms, um, sounds, odors, flavors, physical sensation, and mind objects. What you get from this kind of understanding is you see things as it really, really is with the proper wisdom that there is impermanent suffering and there is subject to change. When we meditate on this, we know joy arises. So the example for us is clearly from one of our meditations. If we meditate on the Pamatha Vihari Sutta and we know what is the difference between dwelling with vigilance versus dwelling with negligence. When we meditate on the Samadhi Bhavana Sutta and we know uh, the impermanence of form as an example. And when we do these meditations correctly, we experience the gladness, then comes the joy or the rapture, then the happiness, tranquility, 
the, the joy flows from the head and then it calms down as you go through the mental absorption. But that is the joy that we experience based on renunciation. Then the Buddha talks about, we go back to the household life, six kinds of sadness arising from household life. So the Buddha then talks about sadness. This is when we make a loss, you know, loss due to forms cognizable by the eye that we had wished for, desired, found agreeable, gratifying, and associated with worldliness. Or when we recall something that's happened before that we didn't obtain, and it's passed, it's ceased, or it's changed. Sadness arises. So all these things associated with forms, sounds, odors, flavors, physical sensations, mind objects, or mental objects, these, this is the sadness associated with or based on household life. So again, examples could be losing a job, not getting the promotion. When the stock market crashes, we lost money, sale of a property, but it falls short of what we asked for. The holiday that didn't live up to the early experience, a pet gets sick and passes away, that sort of thing. So it's effectively any time we experience loss that we couldn't get what we wanted. And as a result, we become deeply unhappy and sad and full of grief. Now, by comparison, the six kinds of sadness that arise from renunciation, based on renunciation, is different. That's when we know the impermanence, change, fading away, and cessation of forms, of sounds, odors, flavors, physical sensations, and mental objects. We see it as it actually is with proper wisdom. We see that the forms now and those, and those that were there before, that they're impermanent, suffering, and subject to change. And so what we generate when we see this truth is that we generate the longing for supreme liberation, for even path and fruit. We want to realize noble attainment. And the thinking that we have at that point is, when shall I enter upon and abide in the base that the noble ones have now entered upon and abide in? And we long for that. Sadness is, arises because maybe we haven't attained yet. So the explanation for this is that we're developing with the intention towards noble attainment of path and fruit. We contemplate the Dhamma. We make effort, but we haven't attained. But we see someone who, who has um, progressed and realized maybe noble attainment or they're experiencing some kind of happiness, liberation of mind. And so when you see that, you think to yourself, when am I going to attain? When is this going to get easier? When is the spiritual progress going to happen? And so what we're left with is sadness, unhappiness based on renunciation. Now, what's really important to see here is the contrast between the two. The sadness based on household life is the lesser kind. Because household life, one is unhappy or sad about losing something that you crave or you desire, something sensual, something very gross, and we don't get what we want. But someone who experiences the sadness of renunciation longs for liberation, craves for the goal of liberation. And when you don't realize that, there's something still honorable about it because it's kusala. It's a kusala intention. Now, what you can say then is it's more honorable. Then we look at the six kinds of equanimity associated with this, the, the sixfold base, you know, based on household life. Here the Buddha says that there are six kinds of equanimity. And when you see a form with the eye, equanimity arises. You're not foolish or infatuated like an ordinary person because you've conquered the limitation. You've conquered and seen the results of actions, and so you, you're not blind to the danger. So what this really is, is you see the danger in sensual pleasures, and you're not falling for it. So you're more equanimous to form, to uh, odors, to sounds, to flavors, to physical sensations, and to mental objects. So that is um, the household kind of equanimity. But the issue here is that one still hasn't fully transcended form, sounds, uh, odors, flavors, physical sensations, and mental objects. You're still limited by those, those sense objects. So this arises when an ordinary person who hasn't heard the Dhamma and they make 
contact with an object, but some kind of equanimity arises. A simple, very, very simple example would be if you sit in a chair and it's not comfortable, but it's not uncomfortable, there's an equanimity towards that chair. And so the equanimity does not exceed the chair itself, that particular form. So it's, it's simply equanimity about that form. Now, the equanimity that comes with renunciation, it's where we know the impermanence, again, the change, the fading away, the sensation of forms, again, also the sounds, odors, flavors, physical sensation, and mind objects. We see it as it actually is with proper wisdom. But because we understand that they're all impermanent, suffering, and subject to change, we have a different kind of equanimity that arises. It's one that transcends form, transcends all those other sense objects. So when we meditate, this is what we realize. We attain to this due to the concentration of mind. So this is the equanimity that is of a noble person, one who understands the Dhamma. So having gone through all of these, there are 36 uh 36 positions, the Buddha says, that need to be understood. 18 on the household line and 18 on the side of renunciation. Now, why this is important is because of the way it's applied. Buddha gives us a recipe, a method in order to develop noble right intention. And this is what connects us to noble right view. So that's what we're going to go through now. So the Buddha teaches that by means or support of the happiness and sadness and equanimity of renunciation, we can abandon and surpass happiness, sadness, and equanimity based on household life, so the mundane worldly aspect. So this lifts us from mundane right intention to supramundane noble right intention. We are replacing effectively the lesser one for the higher one and then more than that. So we're going to look at how this works in, in practice. So let's begin over here on the left. So the first one is, with the support of renunciate joy, we abandon and surpass household joy. So what this really means is that the joy that we get from entering and remaining in the higher concentration, so the jhanas, that comes as a result of solitude from sensual pleasures and unwholesome states. So we are exceeding the joy that we realize from sensual pleasures of household life. We know them to be fleeting unlasting and we know that they will decline so what we said before if you truly see the danger in central pleasures this particular part is easy you gravitate towards the meditation and of course the buddha constantly encourages us to do this in many many teachings always to directly experience the joy for ourselves from solitude from renunciation one particular example is when uh, anathapindika visits the buddha with an assembly of 500 lay followers and the Buddha says to him, and this is after they've given requisites to, to the Sangha, and the Buddha says, don't rest content on just giving the four requisites to the Sangha. Go and train for, for, you know, from time to time. Enter and dwell into the joy that comes from solitude and develop further. This is from the Piti uh, Sutta in Anguttarikaya. And what the Buddha is saying is that the pleasure that comes from higher concentration, be it the jhanas, they can be sustained for a very long time, hours and hours. It's far greater than those peak moments of pleasure that you get from the highest of sensual pleasure, whether it's eating or drinking, drugs, alcohol, sex, buying something, making offerings of requisites and so on. It's not the same. So that's the first part. The second part is with the support of renunciant sadness, abandon household sadness. So as we went through before, renunciant sadness is the more honorable one of the two. This is someone who wishes for noble attainment, for liberation. Now, it's not the same as someone who craves sensual things. On the noble path, craving sensual things is unhelpful, unskillful. It includes unskilled states of mind. So although it is craving for noble attainment, it's considered kusala. It's a wholesome, skilled state. So when we do this step, we are replacing an unskilled state with a skilled state. So renunciant sadness replaces household sadness. Now, the third one is 
With the support of renunciate equanimity, we abandon and surpass household equanimity. So renunciate equanimity is better than household equanimity. And that's because we transcend form, sounds, odors, flavors, physical sensation, and mental objects. When you have the renunciant equanimity, so that we know this from our meditation, we know clearly impermanence, so anicca, we know that there is dukkha, and we know that these things are subject to change, vipranama dukkha. So we're able to transcend them. We see this when we do the samadhi bhavana meditation. We know this when we do the chula sunyata meditation. So what arises when you have the support of renunciant equanimity is insight knowledge, direct experience, wisdom. We clearly know and see it for ourselves. And then the fourth one is with the support of renunciant joy, abandon renunciant sadness. So the Buddha is asking us to go further. So rather than simply thinking and worrying about noble attainments, or the lack of them, or worrying about the final goal of liberation, it's so hard, and so on and so forth, which is our renunciant sadness, the Buddha encourages us to develop higher concentration, you know, the joy based on renunciation. Because as we know, we get the gladness, we get the joy or rapture, we get the happiness, we get the tranquility, we get the concentration. And so with that, we abandon renunciant sadness. And it literally is making the effort towards the final goal. So you have something very, very tangible. Now, many of us forget this and we get stuck in lamenting through renunciation sadness, which is actually quite foolish. The Buddha has said, apply the support of entering into the higher concentrations. Get that di direct experience. Make spiritual progress because it's faster this way. Don't just simply lament and, and worry about it, think about it, circle around that. So even this, as this far, up to this fourth step, you can see that there is a natural progression of this path of renunciation. We're giving up a lot all the time. It's a very wonderful process that the Buddha is showing us. And so the fifth part, the Buddha says, with the support of renunciate equanimity, abandon renunciate joy. So what does this mean? At this stage, the Buddha is now telling us, don't simply abide in renunciant joy. And why does he say that? He says it because we don't want to too deeply or too strongly incline towards the, the concentration joy because we get attached or we, we reinforce the tendency towards that kind of sukha, that kind of happiness. And the Buddha is really reminding us at this point is saying, better to incline towards liberation, towards Nibbana. Don't just get absorbed into the sukkah. But he says it having experienced renunciation and joy. So he's not saying it to avoid it without going through it. He's saying go through it and then decide. So yes, renunciation and joy is certainly better than household joy. Uh, household joy is based on sensuality. It's more gross. But this renunciation joy is more subtle. And what the Buddha is now saying is don't develop a preference that reinforces this subtle happiness and become deluded by that, to want to cling to it and abide in it. So Buddha's advice is to experience it and then to overcome it and then to abandon it with wisdom for something better. And so the better thing, of course, is renunciation equanimity uh, is better than the renunciation sadness. And the reason that the Buddha says that, of course, is because um, it's more stable. Sorry, the renunciant equanimity is more is better than renunciant joy, but it is also because it is more stable. So when you do this, the equanimity that arises, what happens is it doesn't matter whether you experience happiness or no happiness. This is what it means when the Buddha says you don't shake. Instead, you have the equanimity. And if you've developed other enlightenment factors, then they also kick in. Even Idipadas can kick in at that point as well. Then the sixth, the Buddha says, is with the support of equanimity uh, that is unified, abandon equanimity that is diversified. So the Buddha says that the equanimity that is diverse based on diversity, this is in Pali Upeka, Nanatha, 
Nanatasitta. This is equanimity that Buddha defines as regarding form, sounds, odors, flavors, and physical sensation. So that's what Buddha says is diverse. And then the equanimity that is unified based on unity in Pali, this is Upeka, Ekata, Ekata, Sitta. So the Buddha says uh, this is defined as equanimity regarding the base of infinite space, the base of infinite consciousness, the base of nothingness, and the base of neither perception or non-perception. So we know this from our practice of Chula Sunyata Sutta. So Buddha is clearly saying here that the equanimity that is unified is better than the equanimity is, that is diverse. And it's similarly explained in the Datu Vibhanga Sutta when it talks about different elements. So when we went through Chula Sunyata Sutta, what the Buddha instructed us is to completely abandon form to and attain to the formless attainment. So this is what this is really about. Unified equanimity are all these formless attainments. And this surpasses equanimity that is diverse, still associated with form, sounds, odors, flavors, and physical sensation. So, of course, this is even more stable. We go beyond form. So, as, as we've previously looked at, formless attainments, the Buddha has said, or actually Venerable Nagasena has said, it has some of the characteristics of Nibbana. And so we are leaning in that, in that direction. And then the final one that the Buddha talks about is the seventh and final one, which is with the support of non-identification, abandon equanimity that is unified. And what this means is the word that non-identification, the Pali word is atamayatta, atamayatta, I think. And this literally means not made of that, not consisting of that, or not I am that, something along those lines. And in the sutta, it's called non-identification. The reason why they say it that way is because it's in the absence of conceiving of the five aggregates as self, as belonging to self. So not taking them as me and mine, not identifying with any of that. So when you see that all of it is constructed, that's when you have the ability to renunciate it. So this is very much towards the end of the path. We're pushing towards liberation. But it's good to know that. So this includes Cheto Vimuti, liberation of the mind, Panya Vimuti, liberation by wisdom. So what this really means, this last stage, is really when we see things as they really are, that even all these concentrations that we have been developing, and we've looked at this in Chula Sunyata Sutta as well, that it starts with bringing happiness to the mind. We enter and remain in the form jhana. So uh, first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana, with direct experience, we see that they are all constructed and therefore we abandon the form jhanas. Then we enter into the formless attainments. They too are also constructed. When you get that direct experience, you know and see that. Therefore, you abandon the formless attainments as well. What is important here is the direct experience. The Buddha is saying to us, we abandon these higher concentrations having seen them having directly experienced them, not without knowing and seeing them for ourselves. If we don't have that direct experience, we may not properly know why we're being instructed to abandon them. We don't understand that they are constructed. We don't understand how we go beyond them. And we don't develop this true understanding and direct insight wisdom. And then also what happens is we don't see what comes next, how it unfolds from this noble right concentration and becomes tenfold with right knowledge and right liberation. So what we can see here, having gone through this, this portion of the Salayatana Vibhanga Sutta, we can see the depth and the breadth of the Buddha's teaching on renunciation. It encompasses this whole gradual pathway that that continuously renunciates and it's a very important and fundamental part of the buddha's path to liberation we've heard it time and time again the buddha's path it's not about gain it's not about gaining something it's completely about renunciation about giving up all the things that are rooted in greed hatred and delusion all the things that ultimately ultimately lead to relinquishment of everything 
So when you connect this deep teaching on renunciation with what we spoke about, about noble right view, we can now understand what is noble right view. So let's take, for example, the first noble truth of suffering. We meditate on birth is suffering, aging is suffering, sickness is suffering, death is suffering, all 12 terms that come under that first noble truth, all the way to uh, we don't get what we want. In our meditation, we ask ourselves, why does this suffering arise? And then what comes up in the meditation is, it's because of craving. So second noble truth is there. Then if we meditate further, what comes next is a very strong call to give up craving. So then the third noble truth arises. And then what comes up next is, in order to realize the cessation of the craving and the cessation of suffering, we want to develop the Noble Eightfold Path. So then the fourth noble truth arises because that is the way out of the whole mass of suffering. And we overcome all the unprofitable of greed, hatred, and delusion with the profitable, which is non-greed, non-hatred, non-delusion. So with this noble right view, we correctly see that birth is suffering, aging is suffering, sickness is suffering, all 12 terms that we have constructed this whole mass of suffering because of our craving. When we contemplate that, that's where that strong sense of renunciation comes from. We want to give up and renunciate all that craving because it, it ends up that uh, we understand that's where the dukkha comes from. So at this very point in the meditation, right view or right intention kicks in. So we're constructing and following the inside pathway of noble right view. There is suffering. Craving is the cause of suffering. There is cessation of suffering. There is the noble eightfold path that's going to lead us away from uh, suffering. And the mind continues to construct the skilled state of the, these truths. It's fixing on it. It's mentally directing the mind on it, applying to it. So this is where the earlier terms that we spoke about, the tako, vitako, sankapo, apana, biapana, chetaso, abinina, abini, ropana, vachi, sankaro. So all that we said about thinking, reasoning, thought, uh, intention, mental absorption, directing our mind, mental fixity, or fixity, applying one's mind and verbal formations. For a noble disciple, when you're developing the noble path and you have meditated in this way with the right view as the forerunner then noble right intention fixes on the four noble truths and then it, at that point it becomes the equivalent of noble right view so it is then aligning what we went through earlier so the noble disciple sees that because of existence there is birth because of birth there is suffering all those links independent origination, or at least some of those links independent origination. Again and again, the mind is directed and we uplift the mind. So this chetas or abini ropana, and we set it back on the right view. So when the mind is in this kind of meditation, this kind of contemplation, it does not veer off. It does not veer off to any other state. It has noble right view about suffering and the cause of suffering. So if you were to ask the question, where does this lead to? What state would we reach with a mind directed with noble right view and noble right intention? The answer is that it will reach Nibbana because such a mind values giving up or abandoning craving, which means the cessation of craving and the cessation of dukkha. That is the only thing that it is fixing on. That is the noble right intention. And that's the only thing that remains. So if we link to what we discussed in this Salayatana Vibhanga Sutta, how Buddha is instructing us in this way to sequentially replace all these things with the support of one thing, you abandon each thing. You eventually get to this point where you see everything is constructed. So. What you know at that point is that noble right intention is the four noble truths and it is Nibbana. That is what it is fixing to, directing its mind towards, uplifting its mind each and every time. If we meditate like this, if we understand this Dhamma, 
we see the universal predicament not just for ourselves, but for all living beings. Any birth into any of the realms, into samsara, is dukkha. Aging is dukkha, sickness is dukkha, death is dukkha, and so on. And so when we directly experience this for ourselves in our meditation, we penetrate the truth. And it's not a theory. It's not a relative truth. It's all four noble truths. So that's, that's very, very important. So we come back to the Buddha's statement and to complete this noble right intention. The Buddha says, one makes an effort to abandon wrong intention and to enter upon right intention. This is one's right effort. Mindfully, one abandons wrong intention. Mindfully, one enters upon and abides in right intention. This is one's right mindfulness. Thus, these three states run and circle around right intention. That is right view, right effort, and right mindfulness. And then what we know again is this, the, the Pali word for circling around is parivatanti. So we're turning it around, repeating it. We're purifying the intention. So right effort activates to abandon any unskilled states and to develop the skilled states and to maintain any fruit. And it's a purifying process. So right mindfulness Right mindfulness then becomes the gatekeeper. It supports it, ensures that this process happens. So the next path factor is, is around, or the next few path factors are around speech, action, and livelihood. So they're all connected around virtue. So the first one that we look at is path factor of speech. The Buddha says that right view comes first. And in order to for it to come first, we understand wrong speech as wrong speech and right speech as right speech. So again, the same the same thing is coming through. And of course, we go through wrong speech and then we go through the different the twofold kinds of right speech. So firstly, wrong speech. The Buddha says that wrong speech is false speech, malicious speech, which we also know as divisive speech, harsh speech, and gossip or frivolous talk, idle chatter. So what is important here is that we all know what, what these are. We, we have seen this before, like even when we look at the Lhasa when we meditate on the uh, Karani Metta or, or any kind of meditation like that, we, we've been through this before. We cleanse, purify our mind of these verbal actions. The thing to know here, particularly with wrong speech, is around the fruit of wrong speech, that if we repeatedly pursue and develop this kind of speech, the Buddha says for all four that it is conducive to lower realms. And if one is reborn as a human, then it has certain results. So with false speech, it's conducive to false accusations if you're reborn as a human. Uh, divisive speech or malicious speech, if you're reborn as a human, it's conducive to being divided from one's friend. Harsh speech if you're reborn as a human, then it's conducive to disagreeable sounds and gossip or frivolous talk that is conducive to people distrust, distrusting your words if you're reborn as a human. So when you know that, then you want to develop the, the right speech. So, of course, again, we know it's twofold and we know that the first is mundane, that is still affected by the taints, partaking of merit, ripening and acquisitions. And the second is not. The second is actually uh, noble and taintless and supramundane. So in the case of mundane right speech, we refrain from wrong speech, but it still makes us be reborn back into samsara. When we say ripening in acquisitions, what this means is that we are still clinging to the five aggregates, so we can expect to be reborn. We may be reborn to a happy destination, having cultivated skillful speech, and refrain from unskillful speech. But there may be some additional good benefits uh, because of the good karma. So, for example, if uh, similar to what we said with, with wrong speech, if you're reborn into the human realm and you've maintained this, this skillful speech or, or right speech, then what, what will happen is people will trust your words rather than distrusting them, which is the karmic result of, of frivolous talk. So that's something that is that is good. However, if we develop further to noble right speech, the Buddha actually says, and what bhikkhus is right speech that is noble, taintless, supramundane, a factor of the path. 
but desisting from the four, four kinds of verbal misconduct, the abstaining, refraining, abstinence from them, in one whose mind is noble, whose mind is taintless, who possesses the noble path and is developing the noble path. This is right speech that is noble, taintless, supramundane, a factor of the path. So this one, when you clearly know and have activated noble right view, so this is all about the Four Noble Truths that we've outlined earlier as our meditation. Then right speech, noble right speech, is only speaking absolute truth. That means we don't indulge in lies about what is false and deceptive or worldly, none of the unbeneficial talk. Only absolute truth about Nibbana and what leans towards Nibbana. So with noble right view coming first, we can see that noble right speech will follow that having seen that this existence is suffering, birth is suffering and so on, you don't want to harm anyone, whether it's in your mind or specifically through speech. So skilled states arise as a result of the noble right view. Buddha applies the same noble right intention that is taintless. So for such a person, at the time, following the noble path, you abstain from all this un un unwholesome speech. So noble right speech is really essentially saying birth is suffering, aging is suffering, sickness is suffering, death is suffering, and so on. If we speak even one word, that is birth is not suffering, or aging is not suffering, or anything like that, then on the noble path, this is wrong speech, because it is not noble, it is not taintless, it is not super mundane, it is not a factor of the noble path that leads to the whole mass of suffering that leads to Nibbana. So in practice, in daily life, this is not possible. But in meditation, if you develop in this way and see wrong speech as wrong speech and noble right speech as noble right speech, then our meditation comes back again and again to the Four Noble Truths, that this is the ultimate truth and we won't veer off from right speech. So we reject anything outside of the Four Noble Truths and we are strongly leaning, moving in the direction of Nibbana, the right direction, the right path with the right supports and requisites. And that leads to right knowledge and right liberation. So again, you see that because of the noble right view, we have the noble right intention. With the noble right intention, we're correctly thinking, fixing the mind, directing the mind, even having the verbal formations towards ultimate renunciation. When the mind is uplifted like that, then we will follow the noble right speech and the skilled state that come with that. So again, the Buddha says the same thing, that these three states run in circle together. So we make the effort to abandon wrong speech, enter into right speech. This is our right effort. Mindfully, we abandon wrong speech. Mindfully, we enter upon and abide in right speech. And again, this is our right mindfulness. So this run, these three states run together. Right view, right effort, and right mindfulness. So when noble right view about the Four Noble Truths is there, we recognize the importance of internally checking, uh, should we lie or shouldn't we lie? Should we have harsh speech or not have harsh speech? Should we refrain, should we abstain? You know, all those things are running through. When they are running through, right effort kicks in and says, okay, I'm gonna refrain from lying. And mindfully we refrain. It's because of right mindfulness that that's the gatekeeper, that's the support. We know that we need to apply the effort and when to refrain. Now, someone who doesn't have this noble dhamma, that doesn't have this noble right view, then they may entertain and indulge in different views. And those views are accompanied by doubt, a lack of conviction towards Buddha Dhamma Sangha. And so you're always thinking, is this right or is this Dhamma wrong or things like that. But those who have learned the Noble Dhamma, they don't have that. They, it's, it's, it's very much, very strongly, I have no doubt. We have no doubt about this. And um, in that way, someone who hasn't seen it, they will think, oh, maybe it's okay to have this little bit of a lie, this little white lie. But the Noble Disciple who sees this with, noble right view, noble right intention, will say, no, Buddha says, no lying, no false speech, refrain from that. And at that point, then what happens is these three kick in and circle around each other. When that kicks in, your insight, knowledge, and wisdom is also kicking in. 
all factors of the path, the, the other two that we're going to look at as well around right action and, and right livelihood, it's the same thing. It, it works in the same way. And so when you think about it, if you place your mind always on the Four Noble Truths and what you understand and have penetrated, any of it of the Four Noble Truths, that is the most skillful place to put the mind, to direct the mind. And it is the place where you will have noble attainment. It is the place where you will lean towards Nibbana and where you will eventually realize Nibbana. So the path factor of right action is the next one. So I'll go through this a little more swiftly. The same thing arises. We correct or we get the right view. So we know that wrong action is wrong action, right action is right action. And so Buddha goes through uh, the distinction around that. So when it comes to wrong action, this is all the bodily misconduct. So killing living beings, taking what is not given and misconduct in sensual pleasures. Unfortunately, again, many of the world hold the wrong view that it is okay, that there are no consequences, no karmic consequences for these kinds of wrong actions. And they go ahead and do these, these things, not understanding. So if you understand, again, that what you can expect, if you repeatedly pursue, develop and cultivate healing, taking what is not given or stealing or misconduct in sexual uh, sensual pleasures or even sexual misconduct, then you are likely, it's conducive to being reborn in lower realms. And of course, if you kill living beings and you are reborn as a human being, you it's conducive to short lifespan. Taking what is not given, if you're reborn as a human, it's conducive to loss of wealth and misconduct in, sexu in sensual pleasures, but in particular, sexual misconduct if you're reborn as human, um, it's conducive to enmity or rivalry. So when you know that and you um, have a strong conviction towards what the Buddha is saying, then you don't want to develop this wrong, wrong action. You want to develop right action. So we know that, you know, these things are rooted in greed, hatred and delusion even when we look at right action. So again, there's twofold. The one that is still affected by taints, partaking of merit, ripening and acquisition. So we want to refrain from this kind of wrong action and develop the right action, which is the abstinence of killing, abstaining from taking what is not given and abstaining from misconduct with sensual pleasures or even sexual misconduct. Now, for one who is developing the noble state, the noble right action, the Buddha says, it is the right action that is noble, taintless, supramundane, a factor of the path, the desisting from the three kinds of bodily misconduct, the abstaining, refraining, and abstinence from them in one whose mind is noble, taintless, whose mind, who possesses the noble path and is developing the noble path. So for a noble disciple who is meditating and developing the noble path, if in the same way with noble right speech, one directs one's mind to the four noble truths, led by noble right view, led by right intention, then you completely want to renounce these unskilled states. You know that they are harmful. So, for example, you know that if you kill, what you are breeding is anger and hatred because those things come to arise. And when you refrain, the noble disciple knows that anger and hatred do not arise when you're refrained from killing. What really comes up to the forefront is more something like loving kindness. If this is fully developed, then our minds expand and it becomes very vast and immense and it spreads to the whole world. It's immeasurable at that point, as we know from cultivating Karenia Metta. So again, with uh, noble right action, you see that they, these three things work together, right view, right effort, right mindfulness. Noble right effort, noble right view always comes first. But what we understand is, say, for example, if we understand that killing is bad, that it's, it's unwholes unwholesome, and we understand that non-killing is good, that is skillful and wholesome, then we apply right effort to refrain and we mindfully ensure the attainment of the skilled state, so the one that is non-killing, non-harm. And then when we come to the path factor of right livelihood, again, the Buddha says the same thing, right view comes first. 
one understands wrong livelihood as wrong livelihood and right livelihood as right livelihood. This is one's right view. So we see again, Buddha makes the distinction and it's important to really go through. Wrong livelihood is interesting because the Buddha doesn't use the usual way of describing wrong livelihood. In this particular Mahachaturitsaka Sutta, the Buddha talks about wrong livelihood as scheming, talking, hinting, belittling, pursuing gain with gain, covetousness. That's the definition that the Buddha uses. Why this is interesting is because in many other suttas, uh, if we take, for example, the Van, Van, Vanija Sutta, uh, this is Anguttara Nikaya, chapter 5, discourse number 177, the Buddha refers to the five wrong trades for a lay follower, what they should not engage in, which is trade in weapons, trade in living beings, trade in meat, trade in intoxicants, and trade in poisons. Now, this, I would presume, is, is also included in in what the Buddha is talking about is wrong livelihood here. But it's interesting that he uses these words instead of the actual types of livelihood themselves. So for lay householders, what the traditional way of looking at it is always to refrain from any livelihood that is involved in killing or harming and leads to the killing and harming of, of living beings. So for the Pali words that the Buddha uses for this, it's kuhana lapana, nepitikata, nipisikata, labana labang, nijigi sanata. I think that's how they say it. But essentially, what's interesting about these words is that it talks about scheming, deceit. Lapana is around prattling, talking nonsense, um, even being a little bit fraudulent with one's speech. Um, then he talks about insinuating and hinting. And then nipisikata is belittling or trickery. And then labana labang is, of course, around gain, acquiring, uh, gaining profit. And then the last one is around coveting and, and being full of desire. Now, when you spend time contemplating these words, what resonates is what is underlying wrong livelihood. That's one of the ways you can understand that when we go to work and if you contemplate the type of persona that we feel pressured to adopt or the things that we need to do in order to get the work done and deal with people associated with our work, then some of these things do arise. And, and that's where these words start to resonate. So the question you ask yourself is, do some of these words resonate when it comes to when you're actually being employed in, in, in the workplace? And in many fields of work today, if you go from politics to running a business to manufacturing to technology to all different fields across the board, there's a lot of hypocrisy and, and fraud corruption, um, pursuit of profit at no expense, and all kinds of things associated with that. When you really look at that, what does that sound like? That sounds like defilements. It sounds like the, the grounds for breeding defilements and unwholesome states. And that's what leads to rebirth in lower realms, you know, because they're rooted in greed, hatred, and delusion. Now, from a monastic perspective, wrong livelihood uh, the example that we can think of is Devadatta, that although he ordained as a, as a monk and had given up uh, world, the world, he had instances where he pretended to have higher virtue and higher attainments, which he did not have. And this was in order to gain uh, things from, from others uh, and essentially to, to receive gain, honor, and praise. So it linked to the hypocrisy and fraud, to the kuhana lapana. And what drove him was this long-standing jealousy towards the Buddha. So again, you can see wrong livelihood, how that plays out through these qualities. Um, so when you understand that, you, you want to develop right livelihood. So right livelihood, similar fashion to de the development of noble right speech and, and noble right action, we want to refrain. And we want to refrain more than simply replacing wrong livelihood with right livelihood. So more than just unskilled states with skilled states in terms of the mundane sense, 
But when we look at the noble disciple who is meditating, it's really directing the mind towards the Four Noble Truth, led by noble right view, noble right intention, and you completely want to renounce uh, unskilled states associated with livelihood. And so that becomes your noble right livelihood. At least in meditation, this is where we can get to. In practice, if we're lay, lay householders, it's harder. But in our meditation, we can meditate in that way as if we have understood the noble right view and we really want to give up in order to develop the path. So again, the three states run together. And the example we can take to understand how they run together is if someone has wrong livelihood in the traditional sense of the Buddha's explanation about wrong livelihood, if we take someone who's a butcher or someone who's a soldier in the military, in both those situations, they would, if they were understanding with noble right view, what they would want to do is to give up those, those, those employments. They would want to give up those jobs because they see that they want to develop the Noble Eightfold Path as the way out of suffering. If they have these kinds of jobs, it would block that because their jobs involve killing and harming living beings or planning to kill and harm living beings. So the person that has right view would know the distinction between wrong livelihood and right livelihood. They apply right effort to give up the job. And at the same time, they seek to find a new job. And when they do so, they're mindful of finding a job that is skillful not unskillful, that doesn't involve wrong livelihood. And so you can see that these things run together and circle each other and support the, the Eightfold Path. So then the Buddha comes to this statement. The Buddha says, or summarizes about the higher training. So this is the higher training in virtue, concentration of mind and wisdom, that this gets activated and one develops the path possessing the eight factors. It becomes the tenfold path when one attains arahantship with right knowledge and right deliverance or liberation. So the Buddha says, there in bhikkhus, right view comes first. And how does right view come first? In one of right view, right intention comes into being. In one of right intention, right speech comes to being. In one of right speech, right action comes to being. In one of right action, right livelihood comes to being. In one of right livelihood, right effort comes into being. In one of right effort, one right mindfulness comes into being. In one of right mindfulness, right concentration comes into being. In one of right knowledge, uh, right deliverance comes into being. Thus, because the path of the disciple in higher training possesses eight factors, the arahant possesses 10 factors. Hopefully I read that out correctly. Um, so how we understand this, this teaching of the great 40, the Buddha reiterates many times this gradual and sequential development of the Noble Eightfold Path, which then becomes tenfold. Right view is very much the leader, the forerunner. It comes first. And when it comes first, it's knowing wrong view from wrong view is wrong view and right view is right view. If we lead with that right view, we follow the right path and practice. We realize right concentration that is noble. And then what follows is right knowledge and right liberation. So this is very important. If we lead with wrong view, we follow wrong path and wrong practice. It results in the wrong concentration. And therefore, we get to the wrong knowledge and wrong liberation. Another way of stating that is if you understand the right view and you have noble right view, you understand the entire noble A4 path. Each path factor, as we've seen in this session, begins with right view first. It's active all the way through. It's the only way that the other path factors are correctly activated and developed. It's how unskilled states are abandoned and how skilled states are cultivated developed to fulfillment which is the objective of the noble eightfold path so in that sense we can come to understand right view is the noble eightfold path so when we activate and develop with the aid of the three states so right view right effort right mindfulness that we've seen that are running together circling each other and working together that's what we've been through then what we come to understand is that this is how the Noble Eightfold Path works. This is how it is developed. That 
other practices, for example. So the world is hugely uh, focused on primarily mindfulness. When you understand the, how the Buddha's Noble Eightfold Path works, how it's developed, activated, that practice, which focuses primarily on mindfulness, does not make sense. Like it, you don't know where that leads to. It's very unclear. It, it's not activating Noble Eightfold Path because it doesn't even begin with right view. It's just simply mindfulness. So that's a very important point. What the Buddha teaches as bhavana or development, what we also call as meditation, it's developing Noble Eightfold Path to fulfillment, to accomplishment. This is what we're trying to master, the complete path, not just one path factor. And this is what the Buddha teaches as the way out of the complete, the whole mass of suffering. So let's now talk a little bit about noble right concentration. People, when they look at this sutta, they often are puzzled. Uh, the, the question or the statement that the Buddha makes at the beginning is noble right concentration, but their focus is very much on developing the path. But as you can see, it all comes together. Now with noble right concentration, as Buddha said at the beginning, we have all seven path factors as its support and requisite. So right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, and right mindfulness. They are the noble, super, super mundane aspects, the path factors. So how does it work? So this is a way of us going over it again. With the noble right view, we know birth is suffering, aging is suffering, sickness is suffering, death is suffering, and so on you know, the 12 terms. This is our first noble truth. So we know that craving is what creates this problem of suffering. If we cease the craving, that is the best outcome for us. So we know that the noble path is the way out. What kicks in then is noble right intention, a very, very strong understanding, wanting of renunciation. We want to give up the household life, um, happiness, sadness, equanimity, for the renunciant path, the one of renunciation. So what we do with noble right intention, once the noble right view is established, we direct and fix the mind on the same noble right view. Birth is suffering, aging is suffering, the whole mass of suffering. We know that craving is creating the problem. We know that we want to cease the craving and therefore cease the suffering. And we know that Noble Eightfold Path is the way out. So that is established. Noble right intention equals noble right view at that point. We want to give up craving. So then the virtue path factors activate. So noble right speech, noble right intention, noble right livelihood. We are lifting the mind based on virtue and holding it in place. The skilled states of right speech, the skilled states of right action, the skilled states of right livelihood. So they are supporting as well. So noble right view, noble right intention is there, and these virtue path factors are also there. If we're mindful, then noble right mindfulness is guarding the mind, protecting the virtue. When the virtue is intact, noble right effort is there to make sure. So if there's anything that is evil, unwholesome, unskillful, it discards it, it abandons it, it does its job. So when noble right mindfulness is active, it is continuously affirming, re repeating in one's practice, noble right view. Birth is suffering, aging is suffering, sickness is suffering, and so on. There's only this truth. It is reminding, it's because of craving that this arises, that we create the existence, we come back to birth, we experience this whole mass of suffering. It's because of the craving, suffering comes to arise. And so the arising phenomena, the samudaya we, we mentioned at the beginning, is that craving and is that suffering? And the passing away phenomena, atangama, is the cessation of craving, the cessation of, of suffering. When we really realize that, with all these path factors, we penetrate these truths, we enter and remain in noble right concentration. With the mental fixity, the steadiness, the support of all those path factors. 
Now, at the time of the meditation, the mind you can imagine is very, very vast. It's very substantial in skilled states of mind. It has all the skilled states. And the Buddha then goes on and says that in, in what we read out before, in one of right concentration, right knowledge comes into being. So right concentration is there about the Four Noble Truths. And right knowledge is saying, yes, it is suffering. Yes, craving is the cause of suffering. Yes, let's give up the craving. That is the cessation of suffering. And so the next thing that the Buddha said in that same was, in one of right knowledge, right deliverance comes into being. So as we went through earlier, now the noble disciple knows that all these things are constructed. So when we went through form jhanas, when we went through formless attainments, and part of this meditation is you do go through those, those uh, meditative states. You can. And so as you go through, you see they're constructed. You give them up. You realize that the best outcome is to abandon all these constructions. And so you want to be liberated from them. Anything that is con conditioned, anything that is constructed, all these sankharas that are around that. So all those volitional formations. So then the Buddha says that last part, let me just go back to that slide. The last part at the bottom, it says, thus because the path of the disciple in higher training possesses eight factors, the arahant possesses 10 factors. So from here to here, and consider the, these are noble attainments, right view all the way to right concentration. That's what is held by the noble disciple who hasn't completed the path, um, who may be developing or who has some path and fruit. This seeker, at this point in the meditation, has developed it to this degree, but not to fulfillment. And But the Arahant has gone all the way through, has accomplished all parts of the Four Noble Truths, including developing the path to fulfillment. So what we see here about the Great Forty is that Again, the Buddha repeats, and so we see it's very important. The Buddha says, therein because right view comes first. And how does right view come first? In one of right view, wrong view is abolished. It has two parts in it, right view and the abolishing of the wrong view. And then, uh, I read that right. And the many evil, unwhole, unwholesome states that originate with wrong view as condition are also abolished. And the many wholesome states that originate with right view as condition come to fulfillment by development. So because of the right view, all the good qualities are now being developed and all the bad qualities are being abolished. And this goes the same for right intention, wrong intention, the associated state, same with right speech, wrong speech is abolished and all the associated states all the way to right deliverance, wrong deliverance, and the associated states. So when you truly start to develop insight into the Noble Eightfold Path, you really start to see you replace wrong path factors with right path factors, and you also replace their associated unskilled states with their counterpart skilled states. And so this is very beneficial. This is how we make progress. This is how we enable progress. And what we really start to want is to renunciate and to abandon all the unskilled states um, because you see how big of an impact it has on developing noble right concentration and the rest. It becomes easier um, if we practice the meditations. What you realize is it becomes easier to access higher concentrations more readily um, when you give up things so if you give up gossip which is rooted in delusion then you know that it's easier to to concentrate the mind if you give up harmful bodily behavior such as killing stealing sexual misconduct you know yes it's easier to concentrate the mind you directly know it from your meditation and you see that the difference in one's meditation becomes apparent you also see the speed with which you enter into the higher concentration. 
So when you look at the Seka Padipada Sutta, part of the things that the Seka has to develop is the four jhanas. And part of that is you develop them with no difficulty and no trouble at all. And when you understand how the Noble Eightfold Path works and how it's developed, you see how that can be true for a Seka, a noble disciple of the Buddha developing this path. What you also see is that all the factors, all the path factors are important. So it's not just mindfulness that is important or not just mindfulness and, and concentration that is important. It's all the path factors. So this is demonstrated from what we've spoken about in this session. So we can clearly see that if unskilled states enter and activate in the mind or unwholesome tendencies, then if we've already abandoned them, then this is a good thing. What we experience when none of those things come into the mind is stillness, stillness in, in volitional formation, silence. The mind is not moving. And this is with the support of seven path factors. So this is what it means when the Buddha says the mind does not shake. It does not go with anything. And so then the Buddha says, Thus, because there are 20 factors on the side of wholesome and 20 factors on the side of the unwholesome, this Dhamma discourse on the great 40 has been set rolling and cannot be stopped by any recluse or Brahman or God or Mara or Brahma or anyone in the world. So the Arahant has these 20 factors on the wholesome side. So these are the 10 right path factors and the wholesome states that originate from them. And then the other 20 are on the, the side of unwholesome. So 10 wrong path factors and the unwholesome states that originate from each of those. So that is why it's called the great 40. So the final thing that the Buddha says, his final statement in the sutta is about the legitimacy of the great 40, that essentially no one would refute this teaching. No one would censure it or re reject it. So I'll read it out. It says, because if any recluse or Brahmin thinks that this Dhamma discourse on the great 40 should be censured and rejected, then there are 10 legitimate deductions from his assertions that would provide grounds for censuring him here and now. If that worthy one censures right view, then he would honor and praise those recluses and Brahmins who are of wrong view. If that worthy one censures right intention, then he would be honoring and praising those recluses who are of wrong intention. And then he goes on and says the same thing for right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration, right knowledge, and right deliverance. That you would be honoring and praising recluses and Brahmins who are of wrong deliverance. So in if any recluse or Brahmin thinks that this Dhamma discourse on the great 40 should be censured and rejected, then these are the 10 legitimate deductions from his assertions that would provide grounds for censuring him here and now. Because even those teachers from Okala, Vassa, and Banya, who held the doctrine of non-causality, the doctrine of non-doing, and the doctrine of nihilism, nihilism, would not think that this Dhamma discourse on the Great Forty should be censured and rejected. Why is that? For fear of blame, attack, and confutation. This is what the Blessed One said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. And then... What the Buddha is really telling us here is that the teachers were too afraid, too afraid to be blamed, attacked, or censured, rejected, if they were to censure and reject the great 40. Uh, they didn't want to have some kind of reprisal. And so this is the end of this teaching on the great 40. As you can see, it is the best teaching from the Buddha to understand the Noble Eightfold Path, how it works how we can develop it to fulfillment, which is our objective. And this includes noble right concentration. And it leads to right knowledge and right deliverance or liberation and how to realize the goal of Nibbana. So the encouragement is to attend to this teaching, strong encouragement to make effort to understand this more. Up there. There's more depth than what we've gone through today to, to use as contemplation, to practice, to penetrate. We can see also how it aligns with the other meditations that we do when we do meditations such as karaniya metta, 
uh, Buddha Sutta, or painful practice with slow realization, Chula Sunyata Sutta, Samadhi Bhavana Sutta, many, many meditations, because you always activate right view. You always uh, enable uh, the support of the other path factors that are around virtue. You develop the right noble right intention. I mean, all these things, although I've said it out of sequence, but sequentially, we are developing in that way. It's a gradual development of the path, even through the jnana pathas that we meditate on. So the most important thing about this teaching is really to see the importance of the Noble Eightfold Path, what it really means to meditate, to bhavana, to develop the mind, and how we activate it, how we develop it, how these things work together, and that is the path to liberation. <laughs>